Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Getting Started with Marketa APIs webinar today. My name is Ricardo, and I lead developer relations and community at Marketa. We are very excited to start one of many webinars, developer webinars, for you all. And uh, let's get right into it. So today you're going to hear from uh, two members of our uh, developer experience team, James and Winnie. They will introduce themselves shortly. and they will be going over a lot of things uh, to help you getting started with Marketa APIs. Uh, James will go over what developer tools we have available for you all, walk you through how you can sign up and create a sandbox to start testing. Also, we'll define the resource relationships between the card product, users, cards, transactions, everything that you need to know to get a better understanding and context into Winnie's demo uh, technical demo that she has prepared for you all, and we'll wrap it up with a live Q&A. All right, let's get right into it. I'm going to hand it over now to James. Thank you so much, Ricardo, for that introduction. My name is James Moscou. I'm a product manager here at Marketo, working on the developer experience team. So what I'll do is go through a quick overview of the Marketo platform before handing it off to my colleague, Winnie, who will go through the live coding demo. So let's start with the next slide. So what I'm going to walk through today is how you can go to our website, sign up and create your very own sandbox in which you can start prototyping and developing a card program. I'll also walk through some of the API resources that you will use within that sandbox to start prototyping your card product. And I just want to point out that we'll go through one default use case, but our card, our card issuing platform is quite vast and supports many different configurations and use cases. So what you'll see today is only just one possibility. So with that, let's uh, go to the next slide. So this is a pre-recording of myself signing up from our website. So you'll see I start from our website, which is at www.marketer.com, and I'm going to go to the documentation website at slash docs. Now in the upper right corner, you'll see a sign in button. So go ahead and click that and you can do this as well um, if you wish to follow along. And you'll be prompted to sign in. If you haven't created an account, switch to create an account from this screen and then just enter your personal details to sign up. Now, you can't see on the screen, but I've received an email in my inbox just to confirm my email. So uh, I've opened that up and clicked that to confirm that my email is indeed mine. And now it's asking me for two-factor authentication. So I'll enter my phone number and then I'll receive an SMS code and I'll enter that again. And then I'll be signed in. So you'll see I'm on the documentation site again, but now the sign-in button has switched to a link to our dashboard. So if I click on dashboard again in the upper right corner, I'll be taken to Marketa dashboard and presented with this create an API sandbox screen. Now on the screen, we're just giving you an overview of what we're going to create when we create your sandbox. We actually pre-populate your sandbox with, with predefined data so you can get started right away without having to create those objects up, up front. So I've clicked to create sandbox and now this loading screen will remain here for a few minutes. Uh, it does take a few minutes, don't worry. Um, about that, you you can actually leave the browser and uh, go away and you'll receive an email once it's ready. Once it is ready, you can come back and you'll see this API key screen. From here, I can access the application token, admin access token, and the base URL of my sandbox API environment. Uh, from here, I can start prototyping. So Winnie will actually go through how to use these in a card program. But before she does that, let me just walk through some of the API resources, starting with the next slide. So there's a couple of resources you will need to use to get started, and those are card products, user card, transaction, and balance. So let's talk about card product first on the next slide. A card product is really the core API resource within our platform. It defines the behavior and functionality of cards that you'll issue using our API. So for example, it might be where and how the card can be used, such as AT on an, in an ATM, online at certain brick and mortar stores. You can also define global spending controls, such as the maximum amounts that can be spent, the maximum 
balance on that card that can be held at any one time. And you define these on the card product, so you're only defining them once up front, and then all cards issued will uh, inherit that functionality. So on the next slide, the next resource will be the user. And the user usually represents a person who owns an account and owns funds in that account. So by default, one user is one account holder, but keep in mind that I did say our platform is highly configurable and we support many different types of user accounts, such as parent-child relationships, where the user accesses funds on the parent account and the parent can supervise those funds. We also support business user relationships, and this is really important for employer-employee uh, use cases, such as expense management, where you may want your employee to access the company's funds. And so you'll use a business user relationship to model that use case. But for now, we're going to focus on the default use case where every user is their own account holder. On the next slide, the resource will be the card object. And a card represents the specific card that is, is issued to the user. Now, because we defined everything in terms of properties and behavior on the card product, we don't have to redefine them again every time we create a card using our API. It inherits, inherits all of those properties. But the card will provide the data that's unique to that specific payment instrument, such as the primary account number. This is the 16-digit number on the front of the card, and also the expiration date and CVV value. On the next slide, we'll see the transaction object. And a transaction represents a message received by the marketer platform representing um, a message from the network, such as Visa or MasterCard. Unlike the first three API resources I went through, transaction objects are not created by you. They're created outside of our platform, such as when a payment is made um, or an ATM is used. And the marketer platform will actually receive that in real time. And you can set up webhooks within our platform to receive messages in real time in your system when each transaction event occurs. So typically, uh, a transaction may represent money movement, such as an authorization transaction followed by a clearing transaction. An authorization is where funds are placed on hold when the purchase is made, but they, they do not actually leave the bank until the clearing trans transaction occurs at a later point in time uh, when the merchant captures that authorization. And finally, the last object will be a balance object. So you can use the balance object within our API to query the user's current ledger balance. Uh, this means that you can put the burden of calculating the ledger on Marketer and with using the balance object, easily calculate the most up-to-date balance for that particular user. So when you query a uh, balance object for that user, you'll see various figures within that and those represent uh, the different states of that balance. So in the case where you have an authorization that has not been cleared yet, you may see the funds that are available to spend. You'll also see the funds that are still within that account but not available to spend because they're placed on hold from the authorization transaction. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Winnie Tong, who will walk through a live coding demo. Great. Thank you, James. Uh, hi, I'm Winnie. I'm the front-end developer here uh, on the developer experience team, and today I'll show you how to get up and running with Marketa API. Next slide, please. Uh, and we're going to do this through an app we're building called Spratify. Uh, and what Spratify does is every time a user signs up for a service, we'll be giving them a card with $100 preloaded into it. So I think this is going to be a hit with our users. This app is built in Next.js and we'll go through authenticating with basic auth. We'll go through creating a user and a card for the user through the Marketa API, also funding the card with $100 and displaying that card balance on a dashboard. We'll also be simulating a transaction and making sure that card balance is updated. And with that, let me show you what our demo, uh, what our demo app looks like. Um, oh, Ricardo, can you hand over the screen to me? Thank you. 
Perfecto. Awesome. So I already have a skeleton app created with a sign up page, and this captures the user's first name, last name, email, and password. Uh, we'll be using this information later to create our Marketa user. So let me just sign in, sign up, and show you what our dashboard looks like. We also have a dashboard that shows our card uh, with zero balance and the last four digits of our credit card number. This is all dummy data for now, so we'll go ahead and fill that in later. Um, and I also created a sign-in page, which I'm not going to show you. Uh, I've installed Axios to help me with my HTTP requests. Um, Axios is uh, just a promise-based HTTP client written in JavaScript. Uh, and finally, I saved my application token, my access token, and my base URL as environmental variables, so I have access to them during my demo. Uh, and you can find all this information in the API keys page that I think James has pointed out earlier, and you'll have access to this once your sandbox is available. Also on this page is a Hello World snippet. Uh, when you run this in your terminal, you will create a user um, in your sandbox and we'll actually come back and dissect this curl a little bit um, uh, later. Uh, I know we've covered a lot so far so I also want to point out that there's a link on the upper right hand corner. There's an icon with a book uh, that looks like a book. It links you directly to our documentation site. Uh, everything that we're I'm going to be talking about today is in the core API quick start guide. So you could follow along with me there or follow along in this webinar. Uh, I think James has already gone through step one of creating an account, a sandbox, and we just talked about creating a user in your Hello World um, uh, curl. So with that, let's actually dive into some code. Uh, right now, before I start making my API calls, uh, I actually want to create an instance of Axios. Um, so I could send in my custom configs. Uh, that way I don't have to set my base URL and my auth headers every time I make a request. This is just, um, uh, just makes the demo a little bit smoother. I provided a link in the sample code to some of the documentation. So you can read about Axios on your own a little bit later. But for now, we are just going to copy over this, these fields and fill out the value um, once again. I already have uh, these values stored in my own file. Uh, your implementation might be a little bit different um, depending on your language and libraries you're using. I also want to point out that Axios has a pretty handy way of um, sending basic auth headers, and that's in this uh, auth object right here. I'm just going to read from the screen. It says auth indicates that HTTP basic auth should be used and supplies credentials. Those are just your username and password. This will set an authorization header overriding any existing authorization custom headers. You have set using headers. So this is what we want. I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste that over again. And give it my values. Uh, one thing that confuses people sometimes is uh, username and password. Uh, those fields are just your application token and your uh, access token in your API keys page. Let me see that I spelled everything correctly. Great. Uh, so this makes my life a lot easier. Now, whenever we want to make a request in Marketa API, I can just leverage this. Um, so the next thing that we need to do is create a Marketa user on our platform when a user signs up. Uh, and let's go ahead and do that on the sign up page. Uh, if you remember in our API keys page, there's a curl for creating a user already. Let's dissect this a little bit. Um, you make a post request against the user's endpoint. Uh, sending some uh, first name, last name, and active Boolean in the request body, uh, and also um, setting your headers this way, uh, dash dash users. Again, just a 
just a way for you to set basic auth headers um, where you'll be passing in your application hook and an access token. So yeah, let's translate this into JavaScript code really quick. And again, I can leverage my Marketa client. I said this is a post against users. And let's grab these fields. Again, I have a lot of this uh, pre-filled out. Um, if you remember on my sign up page, I have already captured the first name, last name, and email fields. I'm just passing that back, uh, grabbing those values in the request body so I have it available in my app. So let's just grab those last name. I can't spell and talk at the same time. And then To make it easier for myself in this demo, I'm actually going to extract that data. All this data comes back wrapped in a data object. Um, so I'm just going to extract that to make it easier for myself. And the next thing we need is to create a card for this user. Uh, let's actually go back to the getting started guide again. And in step two, uh, you'll see that there's a section on creating a card. Uh, one thing I want to point out is in the documentation, uh, there are inline widgets that let you interact with all of the endpoints. Um, so this is exactly what we want to do for our next step, creating a card. Um, we could click into a request definition to see what you need to pass it. Um, and it looks like my required fields are card for card product token and user token. Um, and we also have a tab here that shows you what your response uh, definition is um, or what your response object will be. So let's go ahead and translate that into JavaScript code. Again, kind of like how we did with our user. And I did say that's a post of cards. And we are required to pass in card product token, which I'll explain in a bit, and user token. And that's just empty user token. You're just gonna have to trust me on that. Uh, card product token. This is something that I think James has talked about uh, earlier before. Um, card products just define certain attributes and behaviors um, that are uh, that of cards that are generated from it. Um, so every card needs to have an associated card product token. Your sandbox environment automatically generates a card product token for you. Um, and so we're just going to use that default. Again, let's use the inline widgets to grab that card product token. Put that there. And do the same thing we did with our user. Let's log that. Great. Um, now the next thing we do is our card doesn't have funds yet. So let's go ahead and fund that card. How do we do that? Um, this is, I just linked directly to the uh, getting started guide, um, but you could read it up on it on your own. Um, you fund the card using something called the GPA order. GPA stands for general purpose account. Um, and then let me go ahead and create some JavaScript code for this. I'll talk a little bit more about the fields that are uh, that we're passing it in just a little bit. And I did say, let's see, that's the post and GPA orders. I copied and pasted my fields here. User token is just empty user from above. Okay. Amount, uh, let's find, let's give them $100. Currency code USD. 
funding source token, that's the default um, that you get from the sandbox, the sandbox program funding. Um, but I think this is just a way for us to identify the funding source to use for a transaction. So how you access funds outside of Marketa. Um, and using the dummy field is good enough. Let's cancel off that as well. And now the one last thing I want to mention is that I attached um, this user object to my session. So in order to have access to it, I am actually going to attach my card response and my marketing user response with the user. So we have access to it. Great. Uh, now let's demo the signup flow. I'm going to clear my terminal. Let's uh, demo the signup flow and see if this works. Oh, I spelled something wrong. So let's sign myself up. Thanks for bearing with me here. Sign up. Wonder if I got into a weird state. Let me just clear my site data really quickly. I already used that email address, so things are working. Um, and great, that worked. Uh, let's see. So. Awesome, I created a user. I got my user object, my card object, and then my TTA order back. Um, however, uh, we're still using dummy data on the dashboard. So let's go ahead and make sure we're grabbing that data from uh, our Marketa API. Um, in my demo app, uh, I'm just sending a props object. And as you can see here, uh, my last four card digit number and the current balance is the this uh, static numbers. Um, so in order to grab the last four digits of my card number, we could go back to the card object that I console logged here. Uh, and yep, there's uh, the field called a field called last four. So let's go ahead and grab that so we can access that data. And remember, I have access to my user. Um, and if I refresh my dashboard now, we should see that value update. And yes, we did get our last four digits of the card number. Uh, now, the last thing we need to do is update the balance of the card. I'm just going to show you how our search works. So if you maybe search for balance or balances, Let's go to the top link and scroll down. And yes, this is exactly what we want. We want to retrieve GTA balance balances. Uh, it's a get on the balances endpoint where you pass in a token. So what is this token? Um, the token is identifying the user or business whose GTA balances we want to retrieve. So in this case, it's the uh, user token. So let's go ahead and translate that into code. I did say get, right? Uh, and this is balances on MP user dot token. And 
again, let's cross a lot of balance. Let's see, the balance object. So now when we refresh our dashboard and look at our terminal, we can see that um, there's two fields here, the ledger balance and available balance. Uh, available balance is the thing we want, which is wrapped in this two period object. So let's go ahead and grab that. Oops, let's say, oops. Available balance. Now, if I refresh my dashboard, I should see that balance update. Yay! Uh, one last thing I want to show you is how to simulate uh, a transaction. So let's go back to the API Quick Start Guide. The last step three um, of the Quick Start Guide is to make a transaction. And I'm actually going to simulate a transaction just using the API, uh, the inline widgets that we see here. Um, there's already uh, some, this shows you the object that, um, the request object that you should send uh, to this uh, simulate authorization endpoint. So we're just going to copy and paste that. Uh, amount is the dollar amount, $10 is fine. MID is the merchant ID, uh, which is just, again, a dummy merchant um, that's set up with every sandbox. And now we need our card token. Where do we get that? Now, if we go back to our terminal, remember we printed out our card object right here. Let me make this a little bigger. Just realize it's kind of small. Uh, great. Um, and you could grab the token. Uh, there's three different tokens here in a card object. It returns a token, a user token, and a card product token. So don't be confused by this. You just want the token um, that's being passed back. And now let's send this request to simulate a transaction. And great. Uh, let's, let's just simulate another one for fun. And now if we go back to our Sproutify dashboard and refresh, we should see the balance update. Great, awesome. So it looks like our app is working. Uh, one other thing that I want to mention is uh, in your development tab, there's also a section called Transaction Timeline. This gives you a visual representation of all the transactions a user has made. So let's look for our card. Let's see, our token is EBE1 and search for it. There it is. And there we go. We could see uh, the two transactions that I have just made. Um, yeah, and then there's uh, the balance and the ledger, which I think James has talked about, um, uh, which doesn't clear until it's in a pending state, uh, until it is cleared. Uh, right now, the, um, uh, the transactions are only in a pending state. And yeah, that is it. Um, if there's anything else you want to see in the demo, feel free to shoot us an email. Great. Yeah. So uh, resources, obviously, marketa.com docs, uh, and the API quick start guide is really helpful. Um, all the code that I've gone through is in this GitHub repository, github.com slash marketa slash Sproutify dash web. Um, and yeah. Like that, I'm going to hand it back to Ricardo for some Q and A. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Anit. Uh, we're getting some great questions, so we're just going to jump into our Q and A portion for the webinar. Um, if you have any questions um, as uh, we go through this, please feel free to send them along, and we'll we'll do our best to to answer them. Um, so we're going to start with some that were sent in um, as you registered. First question, how can I utilize the API to batch create a disable or disable uh, user account? Winnie, um, are you able to answer this? Uh, yeah, um, currently there's no way to batch create or disable user accounts, but I can imagine you can loop through like a list of user tokens and update it that way if you're not already doing that. Well, that's my only suggestion, but that's good. That's a great question and great feedback. 
Thanks. Next question. Uh, there are multiple responses coming uh, by Marquetta to our server. How should we handle that? James, yeah, I'll take uh, yeah, I'll take this one. So uh, Marketa will send outbound requests to your system uh, in two scenarios, webhooks and what we call just-in-time gateway, uh, which relates to program funding. So I'll focus on webhooks for this answer. Um, so you can actually configure multiple webhook destinations within the Marketa platform. You can have up to five different active ones. And at the point of configuration, uh, using the our post web to webhooks API, you can actually specify what kinds of events you want each one to handle. So whether that's a transaction events or transition events for user objects or transition events for card uh, resources, each webhook handler can receive different events and market will route uh, those events to different uh, destinations in your system. Uh, if that's not sufficient, the webhook will contain the payload of the webhook will will contain information that you can inspect to determine what kind of data is being uh, sent. Um, so check out our docs that Winnie demoed. At, it'll tell you the structure that you can expect within the webhook payloads. And from there, you can inspect the type um, you know, and route it internally within your system. Hope awesome. Um, this next question is uh, for you, Winnie. Um, how do KYC oversees, um, how, how to KYC oversees customers? Okay, uh, this whoever asked this question sounds like they're past the self-serve sandbox days. Um, so this isn't a functionality uh, that's available. I think in, it's not available in self-serve sandbox at this time. But I think the short answer is they can follow our manual in the KYC process of like, creating a user account and submitting a request to KYC at marketa.com. Uh, that initiates like a manual review. I'm not sure if our API does support automated KYC checks outside the US currently. Uh, so I would probably defer that question to the rep that you're assigned. Okay. Um, James, next question. What are the security risks associated with different transaction types on cards and how can developers overcome the risks using alternative uh, cryptographic methods and multiple authentication factors. Yeah, so cards, um, as you're aware, have different ways of being presented to merchants. Um, so, you know, originally they just had the magnetic strip, and you had to you know sign the receipts. Uh, I think that's probably the most success success susceptible to fraud. Um, you know, it's forging signatures is relatively easy compared to having to know a PIN number. Um, so, you Marketa works with a, a wide variety of different card fulfillment providers for physical cards. So we support, you know, chip and pin, um, and uh, modern kinds of cards that guard against that. You can also combine that with spend controls to um, make sure that you are only authorizing transactions that you intend to happen. Uh, so, you know, if you're a food delivery uh, use case, you know the the order that someone has put into the restaurant, so you can only authorize that specific transaction, for example, um, and prevent the, that payment card being used in outside use cases. As far as uh, additional layers of authentication, uh, one feature of our platform is actually 3D secure. That's um, something that networks payment networks provide and that we support. So this is where um, when a card is presented to the merchant, um, the card holder is actually going to receive a notification out of band that that transaction is occurring and they have to authenticate that uh, separately. So that might be via email or SMS. Uh, we have different ways of integrating with that feature, uh, 3D Secure, um, depending on the level of experience you want to provide to your uh, end users or the level of def uh, development effort that you're able to allocate. Um, and then finally, in terms of encryption, you know, we do support tokenized cards. So this is where um, you can add a card to Apple Pay and Google Pay. So that means the card information is actually encrypted to the device. And using the device, you, know, you, you can only authorize the transaction using biometric information. So you know, lots of different options in terms of securing transactions and preventing frauds. Um, yeah, so lots of possibilities. Awesome. Uh, uh, James, next question for you as well. How are virtual cards being used for payments 
Does it have a virtual card number that expires after a one-time payment? Um, yeah, there's two parts to this question. Um, so first, let me talk about what a virtual card is. Um, so I, I mentioned that we have physical cards and virtual cards. Um, so if you think about paying for something online, you might have a physical card that you read the numbers off and type them in. Um, you know, you could cut up the card and still type the numbers in and that online payment would still work. So a virtual card, just imagine that physical plastic never existed in the first place. Virtual card is just the information of the card stored digitally, um, but we never actually issue the plastic to the user. So, but in all other respects, it's the same um, with the obvious limitation that you can't, you know, present it to a card reading machine. The second part of this question, does it have a virtual card number that expires after a one-time payment? Um, yes, but not by not by default. That is something that you can configure using our spend controls API. So, um, you know, I mentioned you can specify the maximum amount of money to be spent, the maximum balance in the cards. Another option you can configure is the maximum number of times a card can be used. And this is a very common use case, and we often pair it with virtual cards to uh, issue a virtual card per transaction, and then essentially say that card is no longer useful after that transaction. So this helps, um, depending on the use case, businesses use the actual card's PAN, the primary account number, to identify um, which vendor is being paid. Um, so there's lots of use cases that can be unlocked with that com combo of virtual cards and one-time payments, um, but it is something that we support, yeah. Awesome. Um, so Winnie, I'm gonna uh, jump to this question. Uh, does Marketo offer a credit card reader that attaches to an iPhone like Square Reader for credit card charges? Uh, I think James also touched upon this a little bit earlier. We're uh, it's sure our processor not our buyer. Uh, that means we can issue the card that can be spent at such readers, but not we're not involved in like receiving money. And if James wants to elaborate a little bit more on that, um, yeah. So as when you said, we are the issuer processor, so think spending money, not getting paid. Um, but when those cards are used at such reader, you know, you will get that webhook notification and uh, within the payload, the transaction object does have quite a bit of information in terms of how that card was presented. So you can determine uh, what the merchant uh, used to receive the money, but we're not actually um, you know, involved with it. We don't work with the merchants and their banks. Um, okay. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, what type of transaction would impact our account balance authorization or clearing? James? Yeah, so uh, we touched on the balance object. Uh, you saw when you query that, and there were multiple fields within that object uh, with different amounts. Um, so it really depends on what perspective do you want to take. Do you want to take the user's, the end user's perspective and present? how many funds do they have to spend or do you want to look at the uh the bank's perspective and what you know which bank is the money sitting at and has it been transferred to the uh, merchant bank so let me just reread the question which type of transaction would impact our account balance authorization or clearing um, both affect the amount of funds the user has available to spend. Once an authorization happens, those funds get placed on hold and you can't really use them to pay for something different. Uh, you might see this when you log into your online banking portal. Um, you know, a couple of transactions at the top are kind of you know, in a grayed out mode um, until the end of the day when they clear. Um, but in terms of actually moving the money to the bank, that only occurs um, you know, once the clearing transaction happens, usually by uh, close of business at the end of the day. Um, so you can query both balances using that balance object um, and depending on the use case of how you want to present it, uh, you know, make that decision appropriately. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that you know, we marketed platform supports more than just these two types of transactions. So for example, an authorization can be reversed by the merchant. They might cancel it. And in that case, the funds that get placed on hold uh, become available again to the cardholder to uh, to spend, and you'll see that reflected in the balance. Um, authorizations can also expire, 
if they're never cleared. Um, so if you go to our documentation site, you'll see under webhooks and the event types, all the different transaction types that we support. There's quite a bit. Um, too much to go through today, but um, we went through author authorization and clearing as the most common two. Great. Um, Winnie, I'm going to uh, ask you this question. Uh, hi, thanks for the demo. My question is, once a card is created, is it possible to change the card's product? Or either of you, if um, you want to try to take this one. Uh, no, um, I don't think you can change a card product. Uh, James, have you seen any ways around that? Um, we, you can issue multiple card products and then um, issue new cards on an ongoing basis to the new card product. Um, but once a card is created, it's locked to the card product. Okay. Um, another question here is how, how does your velocity control and authorization work out? Uh, like if I set velocity control usage limit to two, if I do a third auth, is a third auth allowed or defined? Either of you. Yeah, it will be, um, it will be to clients. So uh, the usage limit, I believe refers to the amount of times a card can be spent. Um, so that use case I mentioned earlier about you're having single use cards that can only be spent once. Um, you, that's where the usage limit would come into play. And then thereafter the transactions are declined. Um, it does get a bit complex because uh, for the case of hotel bookings, um, restaurants, sometimes you see them add additional charges to the original authorization. And so what the end user might cons cons consider as one single purchase or one single transaction is actually made up of multiple messages that occur at different points in time. Um, so the, my recommendation is just to work with Marketa. Um, once you come on board, so you'll be assigned um, someone from our technical delivery team uh, who can work through that that nuance with your use case um, to work out what the correct setting for usage limit is. Just to add to that, um, I believe you can uh, set usage limits to be for approved auths that's the default, but you can also set usage limits to be based on all swipes, declines as well, um, sent in by our solution engineer who is tuning in. So just, he wanted to add that. Um, all right, next question. Can you comment on how a user would pay its balance and how is it reflected in Marketa? Either of you like to me, take this? Let me just find it. Yeah, so for paying a balance, um, that kind of evokes uh, you know, a credit card use case where you pay off the balance monthly. Um, so we do have an upcoming credit API, which uh, is in beta currently. Um, so look forward to that, and that will allow you to manage a revolving credit balance um, with you know, statements issued, um, payments made on a monthly basis, whether for the full amount, the minimum amount, uh, so forth. Um, so that's not what we demo today, but that is an upcoming API of our platform. Uh, what we did demo was more of a prepaid use case. So this is where the funding occurs in advance, and we place the funds on the card before they can be spent. And so in this was in this example, it's you who will be responsible for funding that card program as a whole. Um, you saw the sandbox program funding uh, token that we need demoed. That's that's a dummy example of a funding source within the sandbox. But for live, that will obviously correspond to a real funding source where that those funds will uh, come from. Um, but yeah, in terms of paying off a balance, uh, that's that's more of a credit use case, I would imagine. So um, Keep your eyes open for the credit API. Um, James, can you walk us through the uh, certification process, very high level, and steps to go live? 
Um, yeah, sure. So you will be uh, developing in your sandbox and there's t really two main aspects to certification. Uh, one is optional and that optional process is depending on how your program is funded. Uh, we, ha we offer what we call just-in-time funding. This is where funds don't actually get placed onto the cards until the transaction is about to, ha about to occur. So that's why we call it just-in-time. Um, and there's a variant of that, which we call just-in-time gateway, where we actually call out to your system during the transaction and you respond uh, at, in real time, whether that transaction should be authorized or declined. Um, in doing so, that places the burden on you to manage a ledger uh, and the ledger balance. And uh, we want to get that right. So there's a certification process where we actually simulate that within your sandbox to make sure that um, your just-in-time funding gateway is uh, working the way we expect it to work. And finally, when you're about to go live, there's an additional certification step. We use the same simulation API that uh, we need demos and that to um, you know, test out different payment scenarios, make sure they're being approved and declined correctly as we expect. Um, and then from that point, you're ready to go live. Uh, go live is not the same as launch. I will say there is um, still live testing that we do, uh, you know, friends and family mode, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, at, after that point, you'll be uh, ready to launch the card program. We have more documentation on this on our uh, documentation site, actually. So you can go to, um, I think it's card program requirements f on the, in the guide section. Um, it's at the top of the um, list on the left, and that will actually walk through step by step the um, the process for going live. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right. These are some great questions. Please keep them coming. Um, let me give James and Winnie a second to review some of these real quick. All right, so next question. Um, is there a real-time get transactions API or do you have to build the data from the webhooks? Winnie, Winnie or James? Hold on. Uh, yes. Um, I think it's like uh, on get weekly slash transactions API. Um, so there is a real-time get transactions API. Uh, it just, I think it's in our documentation as well. If you kind of look up uh, uh, the transactions endpoint, um, it will give you a bit more information on that. So yes. Great. Um, all right. Uh, this next question, do businesses have control which, uh, which funding source should be configured for the cards or is this completely on Mar Marketa's discretion on which bank to use for funding? Um, let me take this one. Uh, it depends. It's not one size fits all for all customers. We have, we actually have different styles of offering which we call Marketa Managed and Marketa Powered. Um, so one is, Within Marketer Managed, we will actually act as the program manager, uh, which means we actually have a relationship with uh, certain banks, depending on your use case, where we place a reserve fund for the card program. Uh, now, funds still have to be transferred into that reserve fund from uh, your business in order to fund those cards. Um, but in Marketer Managed, we do manage the relationship with the bank. For Marketer Powered, uh, which is very common outside the United States. It's more of a, you can think of it as bring your own bank, um, which is uh, where you actually control all, all of those aspects and Marketa just provides more of a pure technology um, kind of offering without the additional program management services. So there is opportun opportunity for you to bring 
um, your own bank to find your own relationships with them um, according to their you know, regu regulatory needs. Um, it does place a greater burden on you to perform more of the work that we would otherwise do as a program manager. Uh, but we do have the flexibility for you to define your own relationships, re relationships with your bank. Awesome. Um, got time for maybe one or two more questions. There, there are a couple that are coming in um, specifically on um, uh, like card fulfillment. Um, so this one, uh, or personalized cards, or printing of cards. Um, uh, if I have a business and I want to utilize Mercado APIs to give cards to my drivers, I would create a UI in my system and invoke the Mercado APIs to generate the cards. I'm curious on how the card requests are fulfilled physically, or is there a third party who physically prints the cards and ships the drivers? Is there a pre-auth to that? Uh, open to either of you. Um. Yeah, so for physical cards, we configure card fulfillment providers. These are different vendors we work with. Um, and that's configured at the card product level. So it's one of the things that cards inherit when they are linked to a card product. So when you create the card using the post to cards uh, endpoint, uh, behind the scenes will actually trigger a request to that fulfillment provider um, to mail that card out. So within our APIs, there's you know shipping address and all of that information that the fulfillment provider will need. Um, we also have the option the option to do batch requests to, if you want to ship in bulk. Um, and then you will work with us to actually define the card art, the design on the front and back, um, the placement of the logos, and all of that thing, so that that experience can be customized for the end user um, according to your brand. Um, so short answer, yes, we work with third-party providers to do that, but it's integrated with our API. Um, in regards to, is there a pre-auth? Um, I'm not sure what this question is in relation to, but what I will say is that when we ship a card, it's not in an active state. So the card will, the card holder who receives it will have to activate the card. Um, using our card transitions API, and you know, there's various checks and balances we have in relation to that. All right, let's. Um, I think we got we've got to wrap up the webinar. Thank you, James and Winnie, for the time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're super excited to, to do a lot more of these, so so stay tuned for more developer webinars from Marketa. Have a great week.